Thank you, everyone. So now we are coming to the conclusion now. We have the final part of this uh, little scooter retreat. And so we're going to, this is the exciting part when everything kind of comes together towards the very end. Uh, and we'll see what happens when, uh, when that happens. So uh, everything disappears. That's exactly right. Uh, everything comes to an end. Uh, cessation. Uh, so we're going to have a quick look at these last two suttas. Uh, I'm not going to go into great detail because we haven't got time, but we're just going to have a quick look at them just to finalize everything in a nice way. Uh, and uh, so this next sutta is really just a continuation of what we looked at before. Uh, it's the idea of insight, uh, especially insight into the five khandhas. Uh, and it is one more of the suttas which is uh, from the Buddha prior to his awakening. Yeah. So uh, this sutta is called the Gratification Asada Sutta. So at Samadhi, mendicants before my awakening, uh, when I was still unawakened uh, but intent on awakening, I thought, uh, what is the gratification, the drawback and the escape uh, when it comes to form, feeling, uh, perception, uh, choices and consciousness. Yeah, so these are the five khandhas and so we're looking at the, the uh, escape and the gratification and the danger or the drawbacks in the five khandhas and of course this is where the insight uh, is to be had and if you gain these kind of insights into the five khandhas then you are clearly uh, coming to the very end of the Buddhist path. Yeah, you, again this is what the uh, and the purpose of the path is. And so what are these five things? And it's kind of, uh, when you see it, it's kind of obvious. It occurred to me, the pleasure and happiness that arises from form, this is its gratification. That form is impermanent, suffering, imperishable, this is its drawback. Removing and giving up desire and greed for form, this is its escape. So what does this mean? So what is the pleasure and happiness that arises from form? Well, form is like uh, any kind of shape in the human world. Yeah? So for example, if you, uh, if you like another person, uh, yeah, that can be the form that you are attached to, for example. That would be a classical thing. Uh, and then you know that that person is going to get old, the form is going to wither, it's going to kind of disappear, eventually they're going to die, they're going to be eaten by maggots maybe when they die, or they going to end up in a pile of ashes yeah, when they go to the crematorium. Uh, the form is, imp that's the downside. Uh. And the thing is that everything, the problem is that once we see the pleasure in something, uh, the happiness, we tend to attach to it. Uh. And because we attach from that pleasure, that is why the impermanence then gives rise to suffering, because we hold on to these things. Uh. And that is why you have to give up the desire and greed uh, because that is how the attachment stops uh, yeah, in regard to the form. That is why, that is the escape in regard to form. So the moment you are no longer attached to these things, then the issue has been resolved. Uh, so then you, ha you have to weigh these things up, right? Well, what is the, uh, is it the drawback? Is that the biggest problem? Or is it more important to have the gratification? So of course the problem is that always, whenever you attach, we know that it's going to end in tears, it's going to end in sadness, it's going to end in despair, because everything, uh, even though it has a, a nice aspect to it, always down the track, at the end point, there's always impermanence, always problems. Uh, and that takes away the fun in things in the world, uh, when you know it's going to end with depression, sadness, uh, and uh, problems. Uh, Especially when there is an alternative happiness, which is much higher, an alternative happiness that is, doesn't have the same drawbacks, uh, then it's kind of obvious we should go for the higher happiness. The pleasure and happiness that arises from feeling. Yeah? This is the happiness in feeling. Yeah? The impermanence in feeling, that is the drawback. And the removing the desire in regard to feeling, this is the escape. So with feelings, it's very obvious, yeah? either you feel happy, yeah? either it's a good feeling or it's a bad feeling. Yeah? And they are impermanent uh, and eventually you get fed up with these feelings always moving around, the unchangeable. Uh, you withdraw your desire and greed uh, for feelings. Uh, perception, uh, same thing. Yeah? Yeah, perceptions are a very broad category of mental phenomena, almost everything, everything we uh, 
use to recognize things in the world. This is what perception is about. Uh, uh, being able to distinguish different colors, uh, being able to distinguish all the things that you see around you right now, yeah, this room with all these things, uh, everything is based on perception, the ability to recognize things. Uh, and uh, perception really is uh, very closely related to feeling, because without feeling, perception has no meaning. So uh, perceptions here are uh, um, really only are meaningful in regard to feelings. So you can say that it, it resolves into feelings. So if feelings are impermanent, then the same thing is true for perceptions in a sense. Uh, choices, sankharas, sankharas are very important because this is one of the areas that we identify with. Uh, we identify with our choices, being the chooser. Uh, and then you recognize one day that choices themselves are impermanent. They can actually come to an end. And when the choices come to an end, uh, you are more happy than when you were choosing, when you were willing. Yeah. And that means that ch the whole idea of choices m loses its interest. Yeah. And the choices, of course, are also impermanent in the sense that uh, you may enjoy things now, you may choose certain things in your life now. Down the track, your choices may change. Uh, suddenly you don't like those things anymore. Uh, in that sense, they're also impermanent. Uh, but uh, ultimately, you realize that they are actually an affliction of the mind, uh, because all movement of the mind is ultimately painful. Uh, and when you see that impermanence and pain of the choices, then you lose interest in choosing, uh, and you give up choices itself, uh, and you give up any desire to choose. And lastly, there is consciousness. Yeah, consciousness. Uh, the gratification in consciousness is when it, whatever pleasure comes from consciousness. Uh, that consciousness is impermanent and perishable. This is the drawback. Uh, removing and giving up desire and greed for consciousness. This is the uh, escape. Uh, and uh, this is the hardest thing of all to see, because consciousness is basically just the bare background knowing of some things. Uh, but the idea of impermanent consciousness, the one way of thinking about that, uh, is for example in regard to the five senses. It's possible to give up the five senses, uh, and all you have left is the mind sense, uh, so those five senses are then impermanent, uh, they subject to cessation. And when they cease, uh, actually you are better off. Uh, and through this kind of analysis, then you uh, give up consciousness itself, ultimately, uh, and you realize it is problematic. Uh. So that's a very kind of superficial take uh, on these five uh, aggregates. Uh, but uh, it's really just an extension of what we have already seen in the previous sutta, so I'm not going to add much more. Now let's come to the very last sutta. This is kind of a nice and exciting little sutta. And this is called the City Nagara Sutta. And uh, this particular sutta is, uh, the nice thing about this sutta is the simile in this sutta. Uh, but really the sutta is about dependent origination. I'm not, not going to go into detail about dependent origination because that will require a separate retreat. Uh, but uh, we will have a look at the simile anyway because the simile is really nice. So, so at Savati, mendicants, before my awakening, when I was still unawakened but intent on awakening, I thought, uh, alas, this world has fallen into trouble. Uh, it is born, grows old, dies, passes away, and is reborn. Yet it doesn't understand how to escape from this suffering, from old age and death. Yeah, the world is in trouble. There's all this suffering, but no one knows how to get out of this suffering. Yeah. Oh, when will an escape be found from this suffering, from old age and death? Then it occurred to me. Yeah. When what exists is their old age and death? What is the condition for old age and death? Huh? You, know, you know the answer, right? Huh? Then, through proper attention, I comprehend it with wisdom. Huh? When rebirth exists, uh, there is old age and death. The rebirth is a condition for old age and death. Uh, if you're not born, uh, you're not going to have any problems. Uh, birth, that was your mistake. Yeah. Yeah, every one of you. <laughs> and you, it, you, can't, you can't really blame your parents, right? Because you are the cause of your own birth. That's kind of the point, point in this, yeah? 
It is your own craving. Sometimes we blame our parents. Yeah, you gave birth to me. Actually, no. Your parents are innocent. Yeah, you cra- you craved. That's why you got reborn. Yeah. So that's kind of the. Uh, so you are you are to blame. Uh. <laughs> Sorry about that. I am being very being. <laughs> then it occurred to me. When what exists is the rebirth. Uh. When there is existence or continued existence, there is rebirth. Uh. I'm not going to analyze this now because it's going to take too long. I'm just going to go through it fairly quickly. Uh, when what exists is a continued existence. When there is grasping, upadana, there is continued existence. Uh, you grasp onto the world and you exist according to your graspings. Uh, why do we grasp? Because of craving. Yeah. Why do we crave? Because we feel the world. We want happy feelings, we want to avoid the bad feelings, so we crave accordingly. Why do we feel? Because we experience the world. Contact is the uh, word here, but paso can perhaps also be translated as experience. Uh, and when you experience the world, part of that experience, the salient feature, the most important feature of experience is feeling, because feeling is what gives meaning to anything in life. Uh, without feeling, nothing has meaning. Everything is just dull, uninteresting, and you might as well stay in bed. <coughs> So feeling is what gives meaning to life. comes from experience. Why do we experience things? Because of the six sense fields. Yeah? Six sense fields, that's why we experience the world. Why do we have the six sense fields? Because of name and form. Name and form is kind of individuality. This is what decides your individuality. Name is who you are, right? You are kind of... Dis- you are distinguished by your name and by your form. This is how we know that you are you. So this can be considered, one translation here is individuation, uh, name and form. Uh, why are we individuated in this way? Where does name and form come from? It comes from consciousness. Uh, through proper attention I comprehend it with wisdom. When consciousness exists uh, there is name and form. Uh, so consciousness is like the root thing, yeah? the root thing that arises, uh, and from that this whole sequence uh, emerges. Uh. But what is the condition for consciousness then? Uh? You know the answer to that? Ah, you have it very wise. The so consciousness condition for name and form, then it occurred to me what is, when what exists is the consciousness, what is the condition for consciousness, then through proper attention I comprehend it with wisdom, when name and form exist there is consciousness. Name and form are the condition for consciousness. Sorry for speaking so fast, I'm just kind of getting through this. Uh. <laughs> right? So, um, then it occurred to me, this consciousness turns back from name and form and doesn't go beyond it. Uh. To this extent, uh, to which they, one may be reborn, grow old, die, pass away, and re- reappear. That is, name and form are the conditions for consciousness. Consciousness is a condition for name and form. Uh. So it goes back to this mutual conditionality between consciousness and name and form. And this is arguably what the discovery of the Buddha really is about. Uh, this is about the idea of non-self, that consciousness uh, cannot exist as an independent phenomenon apart from individuation, apart from name and form. Uh, and this is the discovery of the Buddha, because the Brahmanical tradition prior to the Buddha, they had this idea of a permanent mind, yeah? Satchit Ananda, uh, the idea of the permanent mind which hangs out with Brahma until, the, uh, until forever, yeah? so it could long time. Uh, and the Buddha said, no, there is no such mind, because the mind depends on other things for its existence. Uh, the mutual conditionality between consciousness and name and form, between consciousness, knowing, and individuation of the person. Uh, that is very profound. Without that individuation of into individuals, uh, uh, basically that is a given. Without that, uh, everything just comes to a stop. Uh, so if you think about this in another way, you can say that if you go back in time, you go back into previous lives, uh, this idea of name and form and consciousness leaning on each other, mutually supporting each other, like two shields of reed. Uh, this is one of the uh, similes found in the suttas. Uh, this goes back and back and back and back, life before life before life. Uh, yeah, always con- it's always been the same thing. Uh, 
consciousness name and form depending on each other. This is kind of the core discovery of the Buddha because it shows that there is nothing in this world that is independent of anything else. Uh, everything depends on other causes. Uh, so from this root it then goes up through the sequence and it ends with suffering. Because of this, that's why we have suffering in the world. This is this discovery of the Buddha. Dependent origination is kind of the summary, the beautiful summary of the Buddha's teachings uh, that shows the cause of suffering in the broadest possible way. Not just the tanha, pachaya, dukkha, or tanna is the cause for dukkha, but this whole sequence behind it. So, um, I don't want to say anything more because uh, too much to be said, so let's leave it at that. Let's carry on. Name and form are the conditions for the six sense fields. The six sense fields are the conditions for contact or experience. Uh, this is, and then all the way up, uh, and this is how this entire mass of suffering originates. Origination, origination, such was the vision, the knowledge, the wisdom, the realization and light that arose in me in regard to teachings not learned before from another. Ananusute Sudhammesu, the Pubbe Ananusute Sudhammesu, the teachings not learned from another before. Yeah. The vision, the light arose. Uh, this is the insight of the Buddha. This is the arahanship, the content of arahanship of the Buddha. Then it occurred to me, when what does not exist is there no old age and death. When what ceases, does old age and death cease? Then through proper attention I comprehended with wisdom. When rebirth doesn't exist, there is no old age and death. That is kind of one of the few links of dependent origination that is very obvious. Yeah? If there's no birth, you're not going to get old. That's kind of, we, we get that one. Yeah? But how do you stop old age and how do you stop rebirth? When rebirth ceases, old age and death cease, then it occurred to me, when what doesn't exist, is there no rebirth? Con when there's no existence or continued existence, uh, there is no rebirth. Uh, existence here can be considered like, uh, uh, like uh, kamic existence, uh, the existence where we produce kamma, including tanha, which drives future rebirth. Uh, this is kind of the idea behind continued existence here. If there's none of that continued existence, uh, there is no driver for rebirth. Uh, and the driver behind that is grasping, the taking up of things. And what Upadana literally means taking up. We take things up, and when we pick things up, we grasp them. That holding on, that craving, is the fuel for rebirth. That grasping comes from craving. We try, try to satisfy our craving, and we satisfy our craving by trying to hold on to things in the world, picking things up, grasping things. And we crave because we feel the world. So if we stop feeling, then craving can no longer exist. So we should maybe stop feeling. How do we stop feeling? We have to stop experience or contact. When there's no contact, then we can't, can't feel anything. How do we stop contact? By stopping the six sense fields. No sense fields, no experience of the world. How do we stop the sense fields? by stopping name and form. When what ceases, the name and form cease. Then through proper attention I comprehend it with wisdom. When consciousness doesn't exist, there is no name and form. There is no individuation. When consciousness ceases, name and form cease. Then it occurred to me, when what doesn't exist, is there no consciousness? When what ceases, does consciousness, consciousness cease? Then through proper attention I comprehend it with wisdom. When name and form don't exist, there is no consciousness. When name and form cease, consciousness ceases. Then it occurred to me, I have discovered the path to awakening. That is, when name and form cease, consciousness ceases. When consciousness ceases, name and form cease. So this is the radical message of the Buddha, that you want to make cease consciousness and name and form. You want these things to stop. And it is very hard to understand the Buddha's teachings because this is like, what do you mean you want consciousness to stop? <laughs> it's radical, right? It's really, really radical and very hard to comprehend. But that is really what this teaching is about. And this is the ending of the five khandhas because the five khandhas are suffering as we saw before. And this is what the Buddha sees at 
during his night of awakening, understanding this entire causal relationship uh, and understanding what needs to be ended. Uh, how can you stop name and form and consciousness? Well, the answer, of course, is to stop craving. Yeah? Craving stops. How do we stop craving? By ending ignorance, by understanding the nature of things. When you understand that everything is dukkha, everything is problematic, yeah, then craving must stop because you cannot crave for dukkha. That's really what it comes down to. Yeah? So insight, uh, seeing things as the three characteristics, uh, eliminates craving and then the whole sequence stops as a consequence. Uh, when name and form cease, the sixth sense field ceases. When the sixth sense field ceases, contact ceases. Uh, uh, and then when that ceases, goes all the way down. That is how this entire mass of suffering ceases. <coughs> cessation, cessation, such was the vision, the knowledge, uh, the wisdom, the realization, the light that arose in me regarding teachings not learned before from another. Uh, so that is the dependent origination and the dependent cessation sequence of dependent of this uh, insight of the Buddha. Uh, and it's a very interesting sequence. Uh, and we have I've done a course here before on dependent origination, and maybe we can do another one again in the future at some point, uh, unless we cease in the meantime, uh, <laughs> which is possible. <coughs> Hopefully the final ceasing rather than a temporary ceasing. Uh, <laughs> So uh, that is just to whet your appetite a little bit about the idea of dependent origination. Now the real reason I wanted to look at this sutta is because of this beautiful simile here. And I want to close this retreat by having a quick look at this beautiful simile here at the very end of this whole thing here. So let's check out this simile. So this is on page 45 of your little booklet. So this is what the Buddha says. Suppose a person was walking through a forest. They'd see an ancient path, an ancient route traveled by humans in the past. Following it along, they would see an ancient city, an ancient capital inhabited by humans in the past. It was lovely, complete with parks, groves, lotus ponds and embankments. Then that person would inform a king or their minister. Please, sir, you should know this. While walking through the forest, I saw an ancient path, an ancient route, traveled by humans in the past. Following it along, I saw an ancient city, an ancient capital inhabited by humans in the past. It was lovely, complete with parks, groves, lotus ponds and embankments. Sir, you should rebuild that city. Yeah. Then that king or the minister would have that city rebuilt. Yeah. After some time, that city was successful and prosperous and full of people attained to growth and expansion. Yeah. So, here we have this person walking through the forest, right? Yeah. So, what is the forest? Yeah. And the forest is samsara. And a forest in India, a forest in a tropical country, as we discussed before, is often very dense. You can't see very far. You have no perspective on what is going on. You don't understand that you are trapped in this existence. You don't know. You're not able to get above the forest to get the bird's eye view. You're not able to get the samadhi, which sees what is going on in the world. So you're finding your way through this forest. And as you are walking through this forest, suddenly you see a path. And of course that path is the Noble Eightfold Path that has been left by the, some ancient Buddha in the past, also found this particular path in the forest. As you're trying to find your way through samsara, suddenly you discover something extraordinary, the Noble Eightfold Path. Traveled by humans in the past, traveled by previous Buddhas and their disciples in the past. Following along this Noble Eightfold Path, you see an ancient city, an ancient capital inhabited by humans in the past. This is Nibbana. Yeah, you follow along the path and you find this beautiful ancient city in the past. And you can imagine that in ancient India, maybe there were such ancient cities in the jungle. And actually there were. We know that because we know that there were previous civilizations in India. 
the Harappan civilization, the Indus Valley civilizations, very famous uh, uh, to the very northwest in India, the Indus Valley. Uh, and there were, and these were may, the ruins of those civilizations may have been known to the Buddhist in the Ganges plain, uh, because these are very prominent even in the present day. Those ruins are very famous in the world today. Uh, so there may have been such ruins. Uh, yeah, so there was a memory of this ancient civilization. Uh, so you follow along. Uh, you find this beautiful place. This is, of course, Nibbana, as you find that you follow along this, uh, this path. It was lovely, complete with parks, groves, lotus ponds and embankments. Uh, and you can imagine that this is probably a reference to all the things that you attain on the Buddhist path. Uh, yeah, the jhana states, the various stages of awakening, uh, all the insights you're able to go uh, achieve. Uh, this is part and parcel of the idea of Nibbana achieving these powerful insights and samadhi states. Uh. And then you inform the king and the ministers. And this is like you inform the people in the world, right? Including the powerful people in the world. Uh, and you inform them what you have discovered. Uh. And when you inform these other people what you have discovered, they too practice that path. Uh. And as they practice that path, the Dhamma becomes powerful again. Uh. Lots of people practicing it. Uh, and many people having the same kind of success, also reaching the same city, the same beautiful groves, lotus ponds, parks, and embankments as a consequence. Uh, this is the power of the Dhamma. This is the uh, Anusasana Patiharya, which we discussed the other day, the, the, uh, uh, the miracle, or if you like, or the wonder of instruction. Uh, and this is the faith, the faith that we gain yeah, in the Buddha. When the Buddha tells us that he has walked this path and followed along, we have some faith because the Buddha seems like a person who is reliable, someone you can actually trust. So the city gets rebuilt, becomes prosperous and successful, and the Dhamma becomes available again in the world. In the same way, I saw an ancient path, an ancient route traveled by fully awakened Buddhas in the past. And what is that ancient path, the ancient road traveled by fully awakened Buddhas in the past? Uh, it is simply this noble eightfold path uh, that is right view, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right samadhi, right stillness at the end. Uh, this is that ancient path, uh, the ancient road traveled by fully awakened Buddhas in the past. Uh, Following it along, I directly knew all age and death, uh, their origin, uh, their cessation, uh, and the practice that leads to their cessation. Uh. Following it along, I directly knew rebirth, continued existence, grasping, craving, feeling, contact, the six sense fields, name and form, consciousness. Uh. Following it along, I directly knew choices, uh, their origin, their cessation, uh, the practice that leads to the cessation. Uh. Having directly known this, uh, I told the monks and nuns, uh, the laymen and the laywomen, uh, and that is how the spiritual life has become successful and prosperous, extensive, popular, widespread and well proclaimed uh, wherever there are gods and humans. Uh. <laughs> Sadhu! <laughs> well said. So that is the uh, kind of the inspiration, yeah? This, uh, teaching that the Buddha discovered in the forest, in the jungle, in ancient India. And uh, it is beautiful simile just to finish off this uh, retreat uh, and just to remind you of the uh, kind of the inspiring qualities of this Dhamma and how kind of it is like finding a treasure in the forest, something unique. Yeah. One of the things I love about this simile and what I find very inspiring about it is this idea of adventure. Uh, yeah, when you go into the jungle, you kind of look for something exciting and you find something awesome, like the ruins of an ancient capital. Imagine how exciting that is if you are an archaeologist or something going through the forest and you find this amazing thing here. And this path that we are on as Buddhists is an amazing adventure here because what we are seeking for are things that are just extraordinary. Here. We're seeking for the highest happiness that is attainable for a human being. Here. We're seeking for the very meaning of life itself. Here. It is an extraordinary adventure to be on this Buddhist path. It is the most exciting and interesting adventure you can be on as a human being. Yeah. 
it not only does it give profound meaning, it ends suffering and it gives you everything uh, that you ever wanted in your life. It is right there for us to take uh, and for us to achieve. It's only a matter of finding the inspiration and finding the uh, commitment and perseverance to do it. Uh, and then it is there available to each one of us. Uh. So that is for you the last little sutta uh, on this retreat. Uh, let's do it. So we'll do a little bit more meditation just to take in the simile and then we can do some more afterwards. Okay. <laughs>